Brother, you ready? Brother Martin? Yep. Okay. If you have a question, uh, this, uh, for Brother Martin, please raise your hand. We'll get the mic to you. <clears throat> Martin, let me just say to all of us, thank you very much. Uh, you, you know, this is a really helpful toolbox you've given us to use. Uh, but can you give us a few warnings about having a little bit more zeal than knowledge now? And now that you have equipped us, but we don't want to go out there and abuse the teachers. Okay, we don't want to go out there and be arrogant or proud. What kinds of cautions can you give us now that you? given us so many weapons to use mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's interesting because the notion of wisdom and weapons came up in that verse from uh, the Ecclesiastes 90 I think it was up there that uh, wisdom is much better than weapons of war and so uh, all the Solomonic and proverbial wisdom in scripture applies about being quick to listen slow to speak uh, and uh, I think starting with opening of the ears and of the eyes is the beginning process um, you may not be able to speak as much healing into a situation, but you can concretely aid a situation as you under get your hands around it and understand it. Uh, and of course, if you have to back off and, and you say, okay, I, I think the situation is very different than I thought it was, and uh, the cooperation isn't there, then you can certainly gently pull out and say, uh, this isn't working out, I think I need to go to, so or escalate to someone else. Uh, but it certainly, uh, we can do a lot of damage with our words. That's the kind of what the issue is here. Is the church does a tremendous amount of damage, whereas the individual abuser hurts the victim, the church can destroy the victim. So if the church goes in there, uh, as it often does, precipitously, uh, presumptuously, as, as you would call it, uh, Jeffrey, uh, that is a hazard that has to be uh, avoided at all costs. Remember, he does not break the bruised reed. He does not quench the smoking flax. He's very, very gentle in his approach. Uh, and so we need to model the Isaiah 42 messianic blessings. And as a consequence, then there's justice. Uh, this, we're probably going to have a replay of the old saying, there's more damage done in the kingdom of God from hot shots fresh out of seminary than any other source. Now we might find there's more damage done to abuse victims from people who got part of the message and then zoomed off and applied it uh, without nuance, without mercy. Uh, uh, or got the, said, well, there's a 1.6% chance that you're lying, which the fact of the matter is either 100% true or 100% false, right? <laughs> uh, so uh, statistics shouldn't be a part to play. And it's easy for us to be uh, uh, misled because there is the occasional case where someone is lying and misrepresenting and, uh, uh, and we, we're likely to be credulous. <laughs> Credulity, we can also mean gullibility. Uh, they play on our heartstrings for a reason. The, the, the abuser. Uh, and so you might say, you might end up in a, in a bad position where you're saying, I've accused the wrong man. I've, I've heard an accusation, sounded credible, the person looked injured, found that it was all fraud, just to bring a man down. Now that's rare, but since it can happen, one must have in the back of your mind the possibility. But the charges being serious, we do uh, need to deal with them. Uh, at no point do I believe that, uh, and I said this before, humanism is the group that says, uh, it's okay if we sweep up a bunch of innocent people and punish them because that's worth it to get rid of the bad guys. I mean, that was the position of what, Lenin or Stalin? He said, better than a thousand of my friends die than one enemy live, right? And so uh, we have to be careful about that. And we must realize, who am I really representing when a person comes to me for help? Am I on God's side or my church's or institution's side? Am I, am I going to be a buddy to the dad, even though this, the, the, the mother is coming to me with the problem? And is, am, I am I going to be colored by that um, association? And if you decide, you know something, I can't be objective about this. Why don't we get someone else in who can be, because I have a hard time believing that's happening, which is, which is exactly right. When you have a double life, as Anna Salter does, it's the tool by which people can be manipulated. <clears throat> they can be beating their wife or doing all sorts of other kinds of emotional, psychological abuse to their wife and no one else recognizes it, and even the family can be torn apart by these kind of things. And so we're, eating, we're dealing with situations that are very complicated. Sin complicates everything, human relationships in particular, because that is the playground in which they uh, fester and grow. So we have to be mindful of all these things. So our biblical wisdom, when we apply it, uh, needs to be gentle, gentle fruit, uh, and not mowing in there because, like I said, sometimes we use the wrong sledgehammer. Uh, 
You might say, oh, we can't hear this, we don't have the two witnesses. Well, maybe you do need to go a little farther with that, even with the one witness. Uh, and there base, there's a basis biblically to do that. And so that, uh, and that involves, again, the, uh, in bringing wi wi uh, wisdom in that may not be evident on the surface, in which case you escalate. You have to escalate to King Solomon to figure out whose baby it is, that's what you gotta do. We don't have a mechanism for escalating in churches because the church is basically in the highest general assembly and usually you get more bureaucratic and less uh, success the higher up you go just because we're playing the church shell game uh, and not focused on individual justice at the level. Because remember, what is the passage there? It says a man, someone very close to you, just an individual man can make the difference. Or a person could be a, a, or another woman coming alongside the affected wife or spouse and she becomes the confidant and she becomes that refuge and says, I'll help. I will intervene, I will protect, I will intercede, I will intervene, whatever it takes. So it, it, the deeds are more important than the words, and if the words are not <coughs> thought out graciously, we, we're better off being quiet and listening and helping where we can, because if we don't have a complete understanding of it or can advise them, hey, I know an elder who can help, who would be more than willing to, to deal with this. This is really tough for me, but I'll do what I can to the extent of my capacity to help but we need to do what we can to be the refuge and then perhaps say, here's a, here's a counselor that is trauma-informed, say, is an important term nowadays, where they can understand the dynamics of it and what's going on in that person's life and what's gonna be necessary to get them resolved and then also deal with the core problem that precipitated the issue in the first place. Hope that helps uh, expose that. The question over there somewhere? Yeah. You actually just touched on this a little bit in the last interview, but um, would you mind going into more detail about how to use the legal standards of evidence in a situation where you may just have a man who is a woman and um, how the witness principles apply there? And if you don't have those, then how do you escalate it as you make this mission? I want to add to that really quick if you can manage it to be where one party says something and then the other party says something and they conflict. You have a problem that says and one person makes their case and so they're kind of examined. If you can tie into the question with regards to not only is there a witness, but you have it. Well, we need to get their side of the story, except it doesn't match up. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, in the scripture, there's a thing that says that the multitude of words there is transgression. And so, well, generally, what has to happen is that you have to do a lot of talking because, as the passage in Isaiah 32 says, uh, and as Adam Smith points out, towards Adam Smith, the, um, the truth, underlying truth, bubbles up to the words. In other words, the, um, the words that are spoken become the truth. They shall no longer be able to utter uh, the, the falsehoods that they use to control the situation, to shift blame, etc. So you, you engage them, particularly the accused, in pretty long conversations because somewhere along the line, if they're guilty, they do trip up and the truth comes out. But the steps that you get to get to that point are you have the refuge point, you move to the point where your ears are open, the eyes are open, and then we have the deliverances that are being spoken of. Um, let me get the exact verse that is there. And I'm not saying it's magical. I'm saying that in the process of listening, these truths come out. But you got, just don't take it for granted. See, where is that 32? Yeah. For the vile person will speak villainy, and his heart will work iniquity to practice hypocrisy, to utter error against the Lord, to make empty the soul of the soul, and will cause the drink of the thirsty to fail. So what you have to do is you have to, in the conversation with them, in the evidence gathering, you work with them because you have heard and listened to the victim, and you, and you speak with the accused, and essentially they, uh, they wrap themselves out. They don't, they don't, they're not conscious of it but because they provide the word salads and things, that's just a way of, of trying to convolute the truth, gaslight, et cetera, then you, and you assemble all this together, you can see the pattern is here of someone hiding something. And eventually the, the reality comes out because you might have a, uh, a damning fact that you bring to the table and their reaction to it shows there's not a repentant heart there at all. Rather, they have a very different response to it. So um, that you, the scripture is, is, indicates that a person can be snared by the words of their mouth, correct? It's right there in Proverbs. And uh, that is where the analysis, where the, if you want to call it the data gathering, the intake, 
as you, as you say, I'm, ex I'm examining the situation, your wife is telling me this, this, this. And so pastoral counseling then has to go deal with this and expand and, and probe. If you come to the conclusion that his story holds together beautifully and hers does not, uh, then you need to continue to, to, to do more work and see what's going on under the surface. But generally, under, uh, under this principle, there's going to be a common point in time where he will inadvertently put his foot in his mouth, and the truth's going to come out, either an attitude or an emotional reaction that he can't control, or something that will indicate that he realizes that you're honing in on him and his culpability, his mendacity, and it pops up. So just keep him talking, because there's a famous thing about predators that they tend to talk too much when someone is lying. They add details that don't belong. The, uh, I just read it in the newspaper about this person who was arrested on the border when he was leading a, a militia to uh, snag folks that were coming across illegally. And, then he, and one of those guys was named Ghost in the story, and he says, we have 640 acres that's been set aside for us to use. Well, that's a very unusual number. That's exactly one square mile. It came out of, of his head in all likelihood. And it's an extra detail that means that it wasn't an honest detail. But when you're, someone's trying to fabricate a story, they add details and put things in that are not appropriate. And so you can, and so you can penetrate this, the, underneath the surface of the facade and let them do it for you. But you, need, but you have to get to that point of moving them along in the process of, uh, of um, them ensnaring themselves with the words of their own mouths, ultimately. Especially if it's a difficult one because it's, it looks like a he said, she said. But there's ways to get past that. I mean, the recordings are very, very valuable uh, in this regard. They can uh, enunciate a truth that uh, no one can deny. You know, that might not be admissible in court in some states, but it certainly lets the Church of God know, hey, God heard it and this tape machine heard it or this iPhone recorded it, and there, there we have it. So we should not despair of the opportunity to um, pull it out. Just because it looks difficult doesn't mean it's not worth the effort to get to the truth of the matter. And by the way, that's where you escalate. You say, you know, we have a trouble. Let's, let's pull in someone who might have better skills at extracting the truth. Because this matter is too important to let it slide. Because if it's true, is a problem. And if it's false, that's a problem. But we can't just ignore it. And so when, once you're on the scent, on the, on, on the, on the, the trail, then that can move forward in, in very, very powerful ways. I think we, if we do our part to do what God expects us, then if we're doing the verse 2 and 3 and 4, we're opening the ears and the eyes, then the rest is going to follow through. But because we're not opening the ears, we're not a refuge, the rest of those verses aren't going to be realized because they follow on the heels of our uh, preparatory actions that are laid out here. So we meet the prerequisites, and then the truth comes out, and no one can, and, and the social lies are exploded. That's what the pro verse promises. Promises the explosion of these kind of lies, but there's a process by which you get there, and the verse out lays that process out as a series of obligations and duties that we see to. Part of it is not hiding from the problem. Part of it is, is protecting the person who might be harmed, and the likelihood is being harmed. And if they lied to you, and if it was a fraud against the debt, and just a way to get out of a situation that was false, that comes to light too. And you say, we, we, we took it seriously, and, uh, and as a consequence, when we dug in, we realized the charge was false. I believe it's going to be a fairly rare thing, but we have to be prepared for the possibility. Because uh, any useful tool can be abused. That's the reality, right? So if they're giving us good tools, someone can figure out a way to abuse them. Uh, to the deficit of an innocent man, or an innocent woman for that matter. She might be accused of something that she's guilty of. And the scripture even sees that, says that. You see someone you know, that you say she's not a, a virgin of Israel, oh boy, you can be in big trouble for that in scripture. Yeah, you can expect some serious blowback from God. Is there a question in the back? Do you have any words specifically about um, for someone who may receive uh, behavior patterns that are the type that a perpetrator might have, but no one typically brought that person forward at any time. Uh, is it a position of authority or just parallel, like a co any like a coworker or something like that? Uh, so you're saying this is a potential predator, then you're observing it, his his or her conduct. Yes. And so the, so the things, the, the warning signs are there. I think you, uh, it depends on the circle of your 
of participation. If that's, say, in your business, and you see them going across the street to the 7-Eleven to get a soda, I don't think you have to run across there and warn them of, that he might be a predator. But I think in your circle of, um, of the office, that might be an appropriate thing where you know, the, the, we have all these systems in place, humanistic systems. That's the HR guy, is, and is there going to be a pattern for the report or the concern? And if you express the concern, uh, at that point, the people who are supposed to take that and run with it or decide what to do with it, it's, it's on them. So it's an interesting thing that the Bible is not actually supportive of the notion of nagging. It says once you've warned a person once of a sin, that's actually adequate in God's eyes. They're on the hook for it, to repent for it. They don't have to be reminded of it constantly uh, or hammered with it. So by the same token, once you've told HR, in this essence, HR, who's charged with doing something, again, humanistically, I'm not in favor of it, but uh, you can't necessarily always inject a biblical ap ap approach in where it is rejected, where the Bible is... Um, uh, the book non grata, right? They don't want to, uh, you apply your biblical rules within their setting. But what you can do is say, I, I'm going to note this person's conduct myself. I'm steeled against it. And, and if I see him moving against anyone, that book, Gift, Gift of Fear by Gavin De Becker, that I put up there, he has an example where he was on an airplane and he was seeing this fellow, older man in his, his late 40s, talking to a young girl and uh, back and forth, and how he broke down the, that woman's uh, interactions uh, and, and the defenses in the process, uh, learning that she had no one to pick her up when they get to Albuquerque, et cetera. And uh, he realized that he, she was being groomed for him to take her where he wanted when they got there. And so, and he made a point of being very close to that person. So as the guy went to get his luggage, Gavin De Becker, Dr. De Becker, went up to her and says, uh, and he had a hard time breaking through to her because she had his, her guard up against him because he just came out of the blue to talk to her. Um, whereas the other guy spent the time as a seatmate connect, making connections. Oh, yeah, no, 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 and all the things that made it sound like, yeah, I know them too. We went to different schools together, that kind of stuff, right? And so uh, he said, he, he's going to try to ask you to take uh, you to your home, but he's not a good guy. You shouldn't go. And uh, she, she didn't believe much of it, and he explained exactly what he's going to do and then left it at that. Now she's warned, and he observed from a distance when he, the guy got back with his luggage, and she decided to push back and see what would happen if she said, well, I don't think I need you to take me. I'll get a, a taxi or something like that. And the guy went ballistic and blew up, and his true colors were shown, right? So Gavin De Becker, in essence, was able to warn someone who he saw was being groomed, according to that, you know, like the, the Grant Simmons big uh, seven-point pyramid, there was a process of breaking down barriers going on. And so he warned her, he said, he's going to offer to give you a ride home, but he's not a good guy. It's a fascinating passage where you can have a practical, just a simple word, and he said, if you, if you say no, he'll get angry. And he called it right. So what we need to have is this kind of wisdom that's very hard to come by because it comes by people who deal with evil things. And none of us want to deal with evil things because it really drives you. It, it, it's depressing. This topic is depressing. I'm very impressed that everyone stuck through four lectures so far on this topic. But it's important, right? So here's a case where a warning was issued where you saw that someone was going to be potentially victimized, and it saved that girl just because someone stood in and said, he, don't go with him, he's a bad guy. Because he saw that she was be, he, he was grooming her to take where he wanted to take her after they got out, because he made all of the, you can realize she's vulnerable, she's not going to come up, they're not expecting her, blah, blah. So the, the Becker, just by listening in, was able to make an intervention that made a difference between a good and a bad outcome. So you have to be on the, on the alert for similar situations where uh, if you detect something that sounds predatorial to you, uh, be on your guard, and if you see the connection being made, express your concern. You can be off the cuff, uh, like the Becker said, but that will put the other person at least on, on a guard enough to say, um, when they push back, see what the reaction is. Because what they'll do is they'll fracture down. They'll, if they realize they're being caught in the process of ratcheting it up, a boundary violation, they'll back it down. And they might decide to pick someone else. Uh, I would rather not be in that organization, but that's how it works. So if you want to talk to me offline about the specific thing in private, I'd be glad to give further information uh, privately. Any other questions? Okay, back there, Shelby. Or no, John, Mr. Tucker. Thank you. Yes, yeah. One of the brief questions for clarification. I know we 
use us with love and care mm. and be alert and respond logically to the consumers and care people. Uh, would you agree we not to also be sort of willing to get a on the foul in the way are you a pervert, are you um, a victim, are you a perpetrator? Right, I understand the question. Uh, we're to believe all things in love. So when we come at a situation and we have no information, our presumptions are going to be <clears throat> your good reputation is yours to lose. Right? So you, you start on an even playing field. Now they might have a bunch of baggage somewhere else and they're on their plea, plea fled another church situation, another state came, announced to you out the warning letter from the pastor saying this guy's bad news and you bring him in your congregation and you don't suspect anything but that's, that's because they passed the buck right uh, it's called it's in the article from uh, rise and build in the handout passing the trash right because I drew attention to the fact that the um, was it New Hampshire one of the states in the New England the school teachers decided that the, the, the union that they did not want to make it uh, a, a crime um, for um, sexual abuse by, of students by teachers. They wanted to eradicate that, which is, you know, they're protecting the, the wicked, right? Uh, and they're hurting the, the, the victim. And, uh, but they also pass the trash. They also move people from one school district to another. And they learned this from the Christians, pass the trash. So you never know in advance if you're dealing with that. Uh, but that's where the fellowship comes in. That's where you do your best in terms of discernment. And then you pray to God, you know, that we don't have predators in our midst, and if they are, they are, that they become manifest, and, and uh, generally they do. And especially if you're teaching everyone to be on their guard and to have proper boundaries. I'm not a big fan of um, Jack Hayford's book on the uh, commentary on Nehemiah, but he says the whole book on Nehemiah, in essence, is a metaphor for building up the walls of our personality to protect us from external attack and abuse. Uh, which is an interesting image, except he throws out the entire practical application. It's about the building of the kingdom of God, too. <laughs> so he leaves that part out because he, he thinks that's, he's a premillennialist. He doesn't buy that as any point for us. So he basically says the only application today is build our walls up. And the walls keep certain things in, certain things out. Uh, and so the church, too, must always be mindful. But um, you start with an even keel if you have no other knowledge. You don't need to uh, check their FICO score when they come in and see what the story is with them. It would be nice if you could, but you don't. And so this it creates, of course, a target-rich environment for the predator. And that means that you know, when we have conversations like this, we're alert to the fact that there's people living double lives in our midst. Paul had false brothers, and he didn't always know them until they manifested themselves. Sometimes it took some time before you know, the coppersmith did him some dirt and things like that. Right? Other question? Uh, Shelby had one, is that true? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you got yours first. Yeah. Um, so, closer. What's on? Article the details are in four. Um, I know the context of that was spiritual abuse and bringing the four a lot further than. You know, there's sex abuse going on there too with physical and sexual abuse. But um, do we define spiritual abuse first of all? And then second of all, what is like a practical strategy for if somebody comes and says, I think that I'm being spiritually abused in this context, like what? should happen with that person, especially in regards to like the refuge point that he was talking about. Um, in how should elders handle that? How should helpers handle that? And how should the person themselves who feels like that's happening to them handle that in the most healthy way? Right. <clears throat> this is an uh, application of the principle that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. What happens is that the, uh, the churches and it happened way back early on, they were concerned, so much concerned about the flock that they started to um, over-supervise, over-shepherd, if you will, uh, and, uh, because they felt that, if, that since they were on account, literally were are, are to be charged with the souls of them under them, 
and they and they had to care for these people, then of course, then uh, perhaps we should uh, have more government uh, over them as a consequence. So instead of the there being liberty, uh, it becomes more of a constraint. Now it was in the interest of protecting them, but the uh, point is that God didn't permit that extra level of protection, and it and though it was intended well. The upshot is that it, it actually undercut the authority of the churches that do it, uh, because uh, you get what you incentivize and subsidize. If you're going to subsidize centralized government of the church, then self-government of the individual man is undercut and is regarded as inadequate. Uh, uh, and so you're not going to inculcate uh, a priesthood of all believers. You're going to see it in a very, very different light. Uh, and so this grew to the point where many churches, um, to protect the church and to keep it sound so there are no problems, uh, essentially become uh, abusive in the sense that the, there's an, a wrongful use of the authority, the ecclesiastical authority, over the people under the, their hand. And this actually is described in some of the verses in Ezekiel 34, uh, the, where they are actually pushing and uh, shoving with the shoulder one sheep to another. Uh, and so it's indicative that, that there's a level of heavy-handedness and forcefulness between them that is anything but Christian concourse or discourse. It, it is moving people out of the way and, and making them feel guilty if they missed a church service or something like that. Uh, it, it's a level where the grace was not abounding in any way, shape, or form. And therefore, churches, uh, things that were conceived as crimes against the church or sins against the church were elevated so that, you know, oh, well, you didn't come to church yesterday, we're going to take this to the elders. And then it escalates, and now you're in trouble. And in fact, this was used as tactics in some of these abuse cases where when they decided it was that they wanted the problem to go away, when they roll reversed and put it back on the victim, uh, now the elders are opposed to the victim and calling her on the carpet and giving her instructions. And now she has what they call a process crime, right? Because if she uh, shares it, like I said, happened, someone shared it with their own mother, now they're on the carpet for that, and we're talking as communication. So uh, it all has to do with what is the legitimate range of authority of a shepherd, and it is to sh literally feed the flock, not to, to, not to tyrannize the flock. And, and so <coughs> once we start crossing into that line, we call it spiritual abuse, and a, a illegitimate use of the authority that the pastor has, because his authority comes only so far as the Bible speaks morally to matters. So he used to apply the word of God, and he has a disciplinary mechanism for uh, specific egregious cases. And in all other cases, he's to be kind of like the great physician, also you know, being a healer, being a refuge himself, right? Uh, and uh, uh, being looking for the 100 sheep that's gone and bringing it back to the 99 that did not have a problem. So seeking out difficult issues, um, marrying them, burying them, as the saying goes, and then everything in between. Uh, but oftentimes in the interest of Protecting them, now we overprotect them. And now self-government of the Christian man and woman and the children and the uh, focus on the family is discharged. Strong families make for strong churches, but sometimes very strong churches make for very weak families because everything is now organized ecclesiastically and it's more likely that the families of the nations are the ones that worship God and come up to see him. Uh, that they're aggregated in churches is simply a, a wonderful blessing that God has because God has, a, has shepherds over them. But the shepherds need to act as shepherds and not be shepherding themselves. In other words, taking care of themselves at the expense of the flock. So uh, Diotrephes is the big example in John 3, right? Someone who likes to have the preeminence in all things. And his authority was so high that it took John going there in person, an apostle, to essentially depose him and deal with the issue of an abusive passer. But there we have an example of exactly that. Someone who was running the show and if he has the preeminence in all things, that means that Diotrephes' will was what counted for that church that needed to have John come visiting and uh, saying, this is going to stop this moment. So it, was a, it took apostol apostolic authority to shut Diotrephes down because the, the flock was too weak to do it. Anyone who he did, he did it to, they tossed him out, right? So uh, that's, that kind of wickedness can happen even in high places. So John dealt with it. Paul dealt with it. The New Testament church was rife with the kind of problems you're talking about. But so they made all these mistakes so that they'd be examples unto us, right? Just the Old Testament errors, so too the New Testament era errors and the mistakes and overcalculations. 
Uh, I don't agree with Aristotle that moderation in all things is ideal because that means that we should be moderately sinful. <laughs> I don't believe that's the case at all. Uh, but, but the principle is that there sometimes is, is a balance, right? Too much and too little of a thing. If I'm trying to water a plant, if I throw the fire hose at it, it it's blown out of the sand. But if I give it a, a thimble full of water every year, it's dead. So there's a, there's, a, there's a Goldilocks point where the pastor needs to have that wisdom you know, about human nature where sometimes the right thing to do is nothing. Sometimes the right thing to do is let the flock flourish under his hand. And that's a very blessed. And only apply the tools necessary. By the way, speaking of uh, pastors, um, where it becomes spiritual abuse, I think this is actually delineated in Zechariah 11 in the very wording that's used here. The second, the last book of the Old Testament, and it's a favorite book of mine. In the 11th chapter, he says this. Uh, here it is, verse 15. The Lord said unto me, Take unto thee yet the instruments of a foolish shepherd. For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land which shall not visit those that be cut off, neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that which is broken, nor feed that that standeth still, but he shall eat the flesh of the fat and tear their claws in pieces. Well, woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. Said, now that's interesting, verse 15, take unto thee the instruments of a foolish shepherd. What are the instruments or implements or tools of a foolish shepherd? Instruments that hurt the flock, right? There's the rod and the staff, which comfort us. Uh, Psalm 23, everybody knows about that. But the instruments of a foolish shepherd are sort of like, like something with a saw point on the point into the, into the sheep, right? That's the wrong kind of thing, whereas the, the, the staff and the, the rod are just designed to just gently guide, move them aside from danger, as opposed to something that actually harms the flock. So the instruments of a foolish shepherd are the ones where spiritual abuse comes into play. They're using instruments that literally, like electric prods and who knows what, uh, and, and sharp things and, and bludgeons and cudgels and stuff. Those are the instruments of a foolish shepherd. And these are made, uh, mentioned by name in this very generic concept so that we can conclude if, you, if they're using those kinds of instruments, that's a foolish shepherd and you want to find yourself a better shepherd to be under at that point. Or he should be cashiered if he's doing uh, abusive things to the flock as a consequence. Does that help explain that? And uh, let's get the microphone over to David. Well, you voice someone? I think in the first uh, oh, yeah, uh, lecture uh, this morning that there are very few uh, abusers who truly repent or which will turn over the corner to him. Does that mean because the, the church, we as a church, has, has pretty much abandoned the church discipline and proper justice? For a few that do truly uh, renounce and repent of their sins, is that a result of proper church discipline being exercised? That's, that's a good question. I think the book by Mold is very good in this regard. Um, the Heart of Domestic Abuse. Uh, where he, he's, what he's looking for is the transformation in the abuser. When we have the full transformation, then they can, and not necessarily as a leader, but as another fellow member of the flock, uh, there is the potential for uh, restoration. Um, but it's more than, like he said, not just little incremental transfer, um, um, fixes here and there. In other words, not just um, superficial uh, repairs, but the foundations are still corrupt. Rather, you're seeing that they're moving systematically to, to do what's right. In other words, the fruit of repentance is evident and it is total, and it is compelling. And at that point you can say, okay, with, then the, we can restore fellowship with such a one as this, because they really have changed. This is a different person than the one who did this. He still had to pay the prices, whatever they might be, and that be severe temporal prices, or he might, mercy might have been shown to him across the board, we do not know. But if we don't apply the church discipline, if we don't even try to, to, uh, see, to help tell him, you need to be transformed, uh, you know, the, you are harmful to the flock and to your own family. Uh, the, if you're not confronting the sin, then the sin unconfronted simply expands. It's like a weed that's not chopped down, it grows. Uh, and the injury, the, the intensity and the extension of an injury will expand if it's not dealt with. So church discipline has its part to play in um, bringing the claims of God 
upon a person and not upon his conduct if no one else is going to, to do that. And so uh, I agree with you that that needs to be done. The, the part that is, uh, Moulds was saying is that that transformation while at a goal, we should not suddenly celebrate and, think and prematurely say, looks like uh, they turn over a new leaf. Well, how long does that take to turn over a new leaf? So you, if you think about it in the Bible, how long it takes for someone uh, from Amalek to get back into the congregation of the Lord, right? Or Moab, 10 generations. Sometimes God allows for a lot of time before. Now, I think that's a very, very long time scale. And I think you can realistically have transformation in a much shorter time scale, perhaps in a scale of many months or several years. Uh, where someone can prove by their actions that they have totally, fully repented, uh, which, by the way, is a very, very legitimate goal for a pastor to seek. But Moses is saying, seek that goal, but don't be deceived by early signs of progress, right? Because it's the same case of the seed that fell on the, the, the rocky ground. It sprouted up really good, but didn't have any root in itself to be sustained in a change. It wasn't what it looked like. So the facade can always be there. Also, some people uh, are more than willing to say, well, I'm going to have to uh, go stealth mode on my abuses for now and build up my reputation, which is part of the fracturing process that Cinnamon described. Uh, and so you always have to wonder, at least for a while, uh, how are we doing? Is it a false front? Of, because you know, are they just doing uh, superficial fixes to make it look like everything's OK? Because what happens then is that they'll say, well, I've done these three little things. How come I'm not fully restored by now? Why am I still being under uh, elder authority and, and being called in every couple of months to, for a meeting uh, to see how I'm doing? You know, don't you trust God? Well, God we trust. I'll else pay cash, right? So the, the, the phrase there is, uh, it tells us that, you know, character is always this in Scripture. It's proven character. And when you have a failure of trust, it has to be re-earned. And it's re not on the terms of the abuser, but on the terms of the community that, that is called to receive him back. They receive him back on the most merciful terms, but also in terms of justice and truth. And so they have to arrive at the truth of his transformation. And so Moral says, yes, we want to seek that transformation and bring him back using all the tools, the toolkit that we have with the churches. But we also don't want to, like you said, celebrate prematurely that they made their first, their first three days uh, and, and didn't hit the wife. So the, the, we're ready to roll. And that's not necessarily true. <coughs> it might be a very superficial appearance of a repentance when the heart has not changed at all. Might even be more resentful having gotten caught. But if there's a transformation, it should be welcomed and mercy should be shown. But if it involves a pastor, he can't have his office back. He simply becomes another sheep. But he can certainly enjoy all the other properties of the kingdom of God. And he can also then be something interesting. He can say, I was one of these bad pastors. This is when, the, when um, was it Tex Watson, who's one of the murderers that worked with Manson, became a Christian in, in prison. But he acknowledged, he says, I deserve the death penalty. So when he speaks to it, he, he acknowledges that he's on borrowed time, and his ministry, gospel ministry in the prison, is a gift that God gave him. So too, someone who is, is, is uh, a convicted predator has a position where he can actually give, provide information or guidance to others. This is how I did it. Be aware. It's like the, the best guys that we uh, uh, to talk to about setting up your house safely is a th former thief, right? Because a former thief will say, well, these are the things that I'm looking for in your house to, to, to penetrate it and take your stuff. So if you do these things, I'm going to find some other house. So too, they can bring an interesting piece of value to the picture if they're willing to do it. If they're willing to rat out their uh, how they do things. Because that's exactly how we find out about them. People like Dr. Anna Salter and others talk to the predators and discuss and see what's going on there, what makes them tick. And, uh, and go from there so we have some understanding of what, what they can do. And if they didn't talk to us, we'd still be mystified and not know. But we do know how they operate. And part of this is because some of them have turned state's evidence, if you will, and uh, given us insights into their operations. And sometimes this is done as a, not a literal autopsy, but you look after the fact, what did they do to get this far? People have to work through all the details of what happened and say, this happened, this happened in this order. And now I can see and reconstruct the anatomy of that abuse, as I call it. Not an easy thing to do, but worth the effort. And sometimes the folks that had done this, uh, who were severe abusers, could potentially help the cause. Because we could then say the information that they provided can be valuable for the future to protect others. But that's up to them if they want to do that. 
I would hope that they do. And I hope there'll be someone who's going to write it all down and say, you know, we can use, learn from this former predator's information. Yeah. Shelby, finally, got another question. Who's, who's next? Oh, okay, David. Okay. In cases where maybe it's not physical, mm -hmm. but through uh, emotional and verbal abuse leads to very real physical effects, yes. like trauma and everything that right. you're talking about. Correct. Um, what, what would be what, what counsel could pastors give and others in the church? Uh, or what could biblical justice look like in a case like that or in the execution? Well, I don't know. If, that's an interesting point because on the restitution front, if there are, for example, counseling fees and, and uh, psychological fees and uh, therapeutic issues that have to be paid for as a result of that, uh, who's going to cover those expenses? Oftentimes the victim is left on their own. <coughs> the nature, say this is a, a spousal thing, usually is what it is when we get to that point of the emotional abuse. Of course, it can be done to children too, but most of the time we have it spouse, you know, husband to wife, rarely the other way, but it can be. But normally it's the, the husband being abusive to the wife, but is not using uh, a physical force, or at least any the present uh, existence of physical force, even though the words are uh, violent and forceful, or demeaning, or designed to destroy them. There's a phrase in Ezekiel 34 that we didn't go into too much of a granular detail on, but it's significant, where it talks about, <clears throat> do not seek the lost. That word lost is a you know, Hebrew root uh, adab, and it means to lose one's self. In other words, that it's the destruction of the self. The self actually is, is detonating and exploding and, and being lost. The whole sense of your selfhood, your personhood, is under attack. And so that is as much an abuse as any other things that are listed in that passage of a sheep. In this case, the sheep being, say, a wife. So uh, the damage there is done. And you ha certainly have the potential sh uh, sanction if this is a perpetual thing that is driving someone worse and worse because they, become, they lose more and more of themselves over time. Uh, this process becomes the chronic destruction of the, the soul, the boundaries in the soul. The value of the person is, is inherently devalued. Uh, and that process, of course, is completely inconsistent with the idea of uh, to love your um, wife as yourself, for example, and to uh, treat her as a joint heir of salvation, grace, etc. Uh, these are failed attempts to be a shepherd husband and uh, the sanctions normally begin with separation, which gives is the husband the, op the option at that point to uh, repent, saying, I'm getting the message now. I've, I've, I've been terrible to my wife. I need to be the husband I need to be for her and not what I've been. Uh, so they'll either double down on what they're doing or they'll repent. And if they double down, they might end up in a divorce. Now some churches are going to fight that and other churches are going to support that. I recommend Dr. Rich Dooney's book, The Cure of Souls, particularly on this point. Because too many churches essentially say you're going to be abused forever. That's your verdict, and God wants you to bear this burden and this cross. Uh, and other churches say that is absolutely untrue. That's a false view of divorce, and it's and no grounds for it. Uh, so a lot of it has to do with the nature and the uh, long term long term effects of it. Uh, but that damage is a very real damage to the person, and is consistent with the intriguing wording of the Hebrew of Ezekiel 34, I believe it's verse 4 itself. Uh, and the Langley actually translates it the way to loss of one's self, not just wandering around or losing, but literally the loss of one's own self. And that's very modern language. We don't, you know, the Hebrew here anticipates something that wasn't known until the psychoanalysis and such things started to come into play in the 19th and 20th centuries. And here it is written you know, on the river Kibar <laughs> in Babylon, in the several hundred years before Christ. Here's a question that was passed up uh, from the community. How do you handle a situation when a man is controlling and abusive with a wife of two of the children? The situation. And the council keeps saying the head thing. I think the problem there is now the council is right. Uh, and, uh, you know, Let's say this about counselors. Ahab had 400 counselors that told him he was going to have a great military victory. And the one guy, Micaiah, who said different, got slapped for his presumption. But Micaiah was correct. He was not going to come back alive from that campaign. Uh, so too, uh, 
the counselors. That's the problem is that we trust the counselors, but usually we don't put the counselors to the test to see how good a counselor they really are. Uh, and so the counselor can function as a very bad shepherd in their own right. They can give bad counsel. They can give counsel premised on a bad theology or a, a, a theology that uh, causes the injury to suffer more, which was actually uh, mentioned by Dr. James Poling in one of the slides I pointed out, where if our theology is, in, is uh, enabling or in, in, um, pers causing to prolong the suffering, there's something wrong with the theology and we need to challenge it prophetically. So it could be that, that we have a whole host of uh, pathologies in the church where the counselors may all have the same. In fact, this is pretty much what happened to the case in that uh, I analyzed, 131 things. Uh, we, that woman had also gone to several different counselors, quite a few, and uh, there was a very small minority that got the picture correctly, but there were those who wanted to uh, push the burden back on her even though it was a confessed sin and an attempt on a violation uh, to violate her. So it's uh, to me, it's still stunning that can happen. But part of the problem was in the counselors. Some were worthless. <coughs> and some were simply would collect a check from her and give her bad advice. And the church counselors were the worst. Uh, I think one case you know, where she simply visited a church and said, what would you do if this kind of thing happened? Asked an elder. And all the others say, well, I sure hope that doesn't happen to, to us. I, that's never happened here, and I sure hope it doesn't. Well, that's not an answer that, ba that basically tells me you're not prepared, you're not equipped, and if it does happen here, I'm going to be out to sea. So that means that we, and a counselor is supposed to be a refuge, a covert, and all these things that we talked about in Isaiah 32, because that's their job, right? To be able to come alongside and help somebody. So uh, it looks to me like we have a case that we need to switch Find, search for the right counselor. Uh, ultimately, that woman did find the advice that she needed because she encountered the law of God. She would stu studied, found Gary DeMar and Rush Tooney and realized that there was something there in the Old Testament that uh, no one was hiding from her. Uh, and that's where the, you know, kind of the, the famous sea change when I realized the whole word of God applied and not just the New Testament or select passages uh, or some worse, the abused passages, touch not thine anointing, you know, then God's anointed. Uh, then we had a more of a, a, a deliverance. At that point, things started to, to clear up, and, and there was hope where there wasn't before because uh, the church looked to be not a place for answers. And the reason that was the case is because the church had thrown away most of the answers because they had thrown away most of the Bible you know, until she realized there was a section of the church that thought, you know, better to err on the side of caution and obey all of the Bible and not just the parts that are in red or in the New Testament that the whole counsel of God, walking by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, is critical. Or as I say this, the counselor must also do this, right? We just got through talking about is Ezekiel 34.10 says, permanently discharged with an oath attached, right? Isaiah 8.20, to the law and the testimony, they speak not according to these, it's because there's no light in them. So if a counselor gives you advice, or a, a, a pastor gives you advice, or even a theologian counsels you, something that contradicts what the word of God, the law and the testimony says, it's a council of darkness. It is, there's no light in it. You can reject it. You find someone who's willing to deliver the light of God's word to you in its fullness, not keep giving you a council of darkness. And so I think that's what we have. Either they're ill-prepared, or they're there basically to protect the church, or try to make sure that the church fulfills all its obligations in terms of appearance, and therefore uh, the church looking good is more important than dealing with the sin that is likely at the root of the problem. Now, there is no sin, then we have a report of a sin that's not a sin, and so we have a slander. Even that's a sin. So something has to be dealt with. But I think the counselors are at fault for that. Some of the questions we have. Five, five questions, six questions left. We'll field all six and call it a day. Sure. Uh, just pass the microphone. Uh, uh, one moment. I know you can use it, I'm to the Okay. Uh, okay. You've spoken a lot about abuse within the church, and your answer there was the permanent and the total Um, But what does that mean for supernatural abuse? Now, I know a number of questions that I have have already been asked, so I'm just going to, like, you know, say a little bit of framework. And, um, so, 
I guess that's part of my point. Do you have a, do you have an actually conclusive line of reasoning that shows the permanent removal in Ezekiel applies to fathers? So that is, can you pull from that text that it is not just um, it's not just like political and it's not just ecclesiastical, but it actually goes down to the level of um, and um, and what does that what does that permanent removal look like? Um, and also in the context of like you know the thing is like there are situations where there is again I was discussed on before where there is no physical abuse um, and there's um, there's uh, and where basically how do you define abuse and who is the arbiter in judging the um, the repentance uh, because you know, what was in response to the second question that we had um, earlier on, it seemed like it was basically when there's one you basically one man or against his wife or etc. It's like you it keeps talking until the to the end is completely eventually go wrap himself out. But that goes into it because clearly if he's guilty and and he's working and not continuing and continuing until he's dead. And so, um, to try to like crystallize this and, and wrap it up into a, a more you know, you know, thought, um, we, yeah, I just, there's, there's a couple points there, but I guess if I had to say just to me, it's just like, um, uh, you know, can you draw clearly from this skill that um, something so, uh, so profound as to, um, uh, well, I guess just the one last thing, so I, I know I have a lot to do, but I only have you know, 20 or 15 to do, um, though it is important. Um, so with the uh, restoration and restitution, um, God, uh, there's the aspect where uh, you, have, you have Saul in the New Testament. Um, no, he was not a Christian beforehand, but he was a spiritual leader to some degree. Um, and um, and he wasn't restored like he had fallen. So again, it's not the same way, but at, you know, earlier on in his ministry, people were skeptical after his conversion, but he eventually, as we all know, was confirmed as, you know, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And so, um, um, I guess, I will go ahead and like wrap this up and allow you to uh, respond. But uh, I'm just, uh, I'm just very. Um, I've also had eyes open um, at the Ezekiel 34 text, and I just want to make sure that um, that we're not jumping, making logical gaps with metaphors and creating something where there's nothing and taking things a little too far um, because. Uh, I'm familiar with the yeah, sure. situation where, you know, where I just feel like things went, uh, things went really far and where justice was not served in the end. And I know there's some people who disagree with that, but, uh, and it's not about that. It's about the ideological um, truth there. It's, you know, that was just a flesh and blood, not with people. Um, so I'm not here to do that. But anyway, um, so just, uh, I know I kind of, you know, put in the floor for any of your what to do before, but uh, I just want to, you know, present those ideas and say that there exist scenarios where, um, where, you know, a, like, it can go pretty, um, it can go from, uh, I guess I'll just wrap it up there and let, let it be taken from here because I don't, um, not try to say that, but uh, I'll say anything else I feel like that. Um, so, so when I spoke about the ratting out, I did not presume that he was guilty because if she's also talking and that's also appropriate, she would rat herself out if she was the guilty party. And because the point of the scripture is not that one, the man is going to expose himself, but the guilty party will expose himself. So if it's the woman has been lying about the husband, say, 
then that also will come to light. That's the promise, but you then have to provide the refuge and all these things and open up the ears and then see what's going on. So it wasn't that I was presuming uh, that it's always the fault of one or the other, but rather that the scripture promises that the truth was going to be is going to come out if you continue at it. Now, the point of Ezekiel 34 is that the sanction is designed to stop the abuse, to stop the harm that's ongoing. It, nor does it say that, uh, uh, in fact, that's the, the whole point, is that there's an authority that allowed the abuse to occur. And uh, there was an abuse of an authority in which uh, the shepherd, the one who was to take care of those under his hand. Now, the very fact that there's a deposition here, uh, they, they're both deposed from shepherd back to sheep, so they got judges between them, is indicative that the status as a shepherd has now been abrogated by God. Uh, under his command and, and that, that, that dynamic. And so the notion of shepherds in scripture is always a broad one. It applies to the relationship between the civil authorities and the people, the religious authorities and the people, uh, a priest and the people, a Levite and the people, uh, and a father to the children is also a relationship of shepherd because he is to feed them. And that is a shepherding task. That is, in fact, their, their, their same idea, to feed them, to shepherd the flock, to feed the flock, to take care of them, to nourish them, and to bring them up. And, and so the family, the father is supposed to bring them up and nurture and nourish the mission of the Lord. This is also a pastoral task for someone that we would call a pastor or a reverend. Uh, and as pointed out uh, by, I think it was Greenhill, the terms used in Ezekiel 34 are extremely general and, are, and, and therefore designed to be applied across the board to all human relationships where there's an authority relationship. And where that relationship is harmed, then is to be uh, by the person who had the power and authority, then that relationship can be broken and they can have that, there will be that permanent removal. And in the case of an emotional abuse, we would have again the sense that of the loss of the self, that is the destruction of the uh, worldview and the self perception of an individual so that they are gone. They become that dried out um, land. They become a wasteland, if you will. Uh, and it's talked about in Isaiah 32. And the two passages, I think, deal with the, the one solution and then the opposite side where uh, the tasks are given to everyone who's a member of the kingdom of God uh, to deal with. And also, it's this, the phrase is used, that you are a stone in a, uh, a big boulder in a land of fainting, is the original Hebrew best translation, where someone is literally fainting from the burdens that are upon them. Uh, so we have the loss of the self, the fainting, the, the weariness, the burdens that are being applied, and no one lifting a finger to help. So under these circumstances, these things can occur in churches, they can occur civilly, uh, they can also occur in families. And so because the sin is the same sin, the solution to it, you're saying, well, if the civil government did this to her, uh, we would get rid of, say, the mayor. But if the husband did it to her, everything's okay because there are no sanctions to be had for that. So uh, that's saying this particular shepherd is culpable, but this other shepherd is excused or not under the text. Remember the text uh, in scripture is this, that commandment is exceeding broad. So when Paul deals with Deuteronomy 25, 4, thou shalt not muzzle the ox to tread out the grain, he ends up extending this all the way to the notion that a, uh, people who minister in the word are worthy of double honor. Uh, that, uh, so how do you get that from uh, animal ordinance that talks about grain and uh, uh, ox getting a, uh, treading a treadmill? Because the application of the scripture is certain and he applies it with wisdom and with the sense of its justice. And so the matter there is that the just application of that passage shows that it was not just intended for um, the oxen, but for something bigger than that. So uh, same token, the generality of the language in Ezekiel 34, the fact that we have uh, a, a relationship higher to the lower, and then we have an abuse of that relationship uh, that is uh, harming, if you will, even soul murdering, uh, then the person who is the husband who was supposed to be washing the wife in the water of the word is literally throwing her instead from a psychological point into the mud pit continually and will not hear anyone who says that that's the case. Uh, and so I don't think we can then say let's forget uh, any application of this passage of scripture. 
because I'm going to uh, state it, I'm going to have a narrow view of the application. Now, there's times when we have a narrow view, um, and the context will deliver that. But when you use the general terms like this, and where he mixes terms, know, turns a shepherd into a sheep, turns the sheep into a buck in the next clause, then we're seeing there's a huge generality in this passage, and we can't suddenly say, we're going to hammer it to what happened in Babylon you know, in the 7th century BC uh, for Israel only. No, it is uh, much broader than that. And we also have this to um, consider that all those things that happened to them were in samples unto us. Um, and so we're trying to take the and apply the lessons that were learned from them under those circumstances. But the very fact that it's a general passage and the terms are used in the most general sense and not in a restrictive sense uh, tells us that we are sound in saying the application is wider. Um, in fact, not so much that we're, that we're widening it, we're saying we're acknowledging that it is as wide as that. And that is the fair way to approach it. In other words, we're not do, making undue capital one way or the other of the term shepherd. Uh, we're not, for example, we would not say that the passage deals with literal shepherds because they're not in an authority position over the sheep because they're not themselves, they're not humans. They don't acknowledge human authority except with the stick. Uh, and therefore, you're not supposed to use any harmful instruments even there. But uh, rolling back to the original question, it's again a complicated thing. You're mentioning emotional abuse. Uh, there's clarity that that is a very damaging thing in their own right. And if a husband is damaging their wife and instead of nourishing her, then the terms of that covenant have already been broken. Uh, the covenant of marriage is one of mutual nourishment. It's not a one-way street. And so at the point in time when there is that one-way abuse, uh, whether it's covered up or accepted or what have you, it's not going to change the fact that it's damaging and it conflicts with his application of the covenant of marriage, then his words to the contrary will not bear any weight. And so that is already a, a, a broken covenant at that point. Uh, because the terms of the, of the marriage, the vow, has already been broken. You know, in, if it's a Christian vow, it is already broken to that point because of the actions that have precipitated over whatever period of time that led to the crisis that they, that we, we might be um, trying to analyze after the fact. So I think I'll leave that at there. Ezekiel 34 terms, I think, safely are generalized. There's a bunch of scriptures that indicate that we can. And we have the whole issue of the nature of the marital covenant in the first place and what constitutes a violation of it. And uh, at that point, um, there were options um, that can occur in any situation. Again, it can be separation, which is something that can be quite a long time, according to First Corinthians 7. The option being stay separate or uh, uh, be reconciled, or uh, the most severe course of action, divorce. Uh, and if that's where, where we end up, then I would say that uh, that covenant, we're simply acknowledging after the fact that the condition of the covenant that already is in the state. In other words, it is a piece of paperwork at that point to acknowledge what's already the physical, the spiritual reality in that home. That that covenant has become an empty piece of paper. Thank you, Dr. Scott Brady, for the lectures. I appreciate the time. Uh, I want to drive home a very foundational point here and one that was taken as an assumption throughout, and that is, what is the biblical definition of abuse? Hard fast in scripture, and um, building upon that, a definition also like the definition to the more elusive emotional abuse, and how that can be um, prosecuted or evidence can be found for it in a situation. Also, I noticed um, you hit home on the, on the example where a husband doubled down, but, you know, but the other side of it was the, the husband or the perpetrator or perpetrator in the situation repented. And so, is, is he allowed to be restored to his position? I think that the, the potential for that is, is there. It, it, but you have to have that transformation. That's where I think the book by Moles, The Heart of Domestic Violence, uh, or I think that's the title, or Domestic Abuse, uh, is useful because he looks for that transformation. 
but he's also seen people fake it, you know, the fake it till you make it kind of thing, and some people don't make it, they, they just only fake it. So this is an interesting question. As opposed to the first point that you made, abuse, what's the definition? The trouble is that the Bible speaks to it in metaphors and figures. For example, in Ezekiel 34 itself, he says, uh, it seems a small thing unto you to have eaten up the good pasture, but you must you tread down with your feet the residue of your pastures and to have drunk of the deep waters, but you must follow the residue with your feet. And as for my flock, they eat that which you have trodden with your feet, and they drink that which you have followed with your feet. So obviously what we have is very general pictures. We have pictures of what it is. That these are all the things that if you were a sheep, you wouldn't want to be in these positions where you're forced to uh, eat grass that's been knocked down. You're forced to drink water that's got dirt in it. No one is saying that this is literally happening to anybody, but these are the imagery that shows it. So again, there's a very general notion of abuse, which is again, intended to harm. Harm somebody by putting self first and the other person last. Uh, whereas in the scripture, you are to prefer the other person more than you, better than yourself, right? That's the biblical picture. You are to treat them better than you would treat yourself. But the abuser treats himself better than he treats anybody else, but tells everybody that, that is a very different state. So important to see here that abuse uh, is something that is, it was like the Supreme Court guy says, and I, I know what a sin is, but I know it is when I see it. Can't define it, but I know what it is when I see it. So to abuse is, is depicted in such a way that if it were to be laid out as you know, hit, hit, her, hit her with a stick harder than uh, 27 newtons of force, then we'd all say, well, I'm allowed to hit her with a stick with 26 newtons of force because the limit is 27. So God does not give us something like, or, or there was a balsa stick, well, I used a teak stick, or I used uh, a plastic stick. See, once the scripture tries to pin something down, then men always try to figure out a way around it. Right. See, so God then gives us these generalities so that we can't evade the truth of God. Because when we look at an abuse, we say, well, all these things are tantamount to these images that the Bible gives us that are so vivid that you can't escape the fact that they describe something abusive. If I'm about to drink into that water, I'm a sheep, and then another sheep sticks their dirty feet in it on purpose and walks away just to do it, then we know I've been messed with, right? Uh, and so that's why the biblical images are not, con they're, they're concrete as images, but they are not laid down in, in um, statutory form to say this is what abuse and this is what is not abuse. It is put in such a general way so that all of human sin and this glorious evil that reeks to the heavens is exposed for us to see and to repent from. Yes, someone has a mic? Shelby again? Oh yeah. No, her mic's <laughs> going to get dizzy. Yeah, um, with you were just talking about you know the definition of abuse and how does that interact with the theme of oppression that's in scripture that God stands against because I think a lot of times we get tripped up because we look in our concordance and we can't find the word abuse in our KJV but the word oppression is there and like when we're reading our scripture and we see that theme and that God stands against oppressors very strongly how can we bring that in take that in in a way that we can use always interface with the abuse issue. Right. Uh, and again, that's a very good point. Uh, oppression, again, is a relationship between two people that is unmediated. It is not The word of law of God is not mediating the relationship. That action between two people is now mediated, un, uh, unmediated. It's direct action with God's law pulled out of the picture. So it's an unlawful mediation or action between people. Uh, and that's what all oppression is. In fact, tyranny is simply rule, uh, lawless rule. That's what tyranny uh, technically is, is rule without the law of God. And so relationships with the law of God is not the central governing factor are inherently tyrannical. They're also inherently oppressive, and they're also uh, all destined for the dust heap because they cannot last. Uh, you're building your house on sand, my people, my friends if you're oppressing your spouse or your pastor's oppressing the flock, that's a house built on sand and it'll fall, it cannot stand. It has to be built on the rock and everyone must be on the rock at the same time. So uh, we have a promise in Zechariah that for every oppressor there is a deliverer or a destroyer. So uh, there were four um, horns uh, that were raised up to free, uh, free Israel, but God then appoints four smiths to cut them down. 
So the beauty of it is when God's law is being applied for every oppressor, there will be a, someone to destroy or, or release the oppression. But if God's word is not applied, then all oppressors are present and everyone's oppressing one another. And that's you get uh, what Orwell talks about in the future is a human, imagine a human a boot stepping on a human face forever. That's oppression uh, essentially unrestrained. Law of God is there to restrain evil, sin, transgression, oppression, all these ways, and oppression really is to, to be pressing down on somebody, uh, to, to throw burdens on them of any nature, emotional, physical, um, medical, those are all forms of oppression, uh, and it's in a denial of that person's, that person's personhood, their humanity. There's something less than a human, they're a slave, they're subservient to your needs, uh, and so narcissism often comes into play uh, when uh, oppression is in the mix. Now you can simply be an evil person and oppress somebody just out of spite, um, and that happens too. You have to remember that, that uh, when we spoke about the passage in Ecclesiastes 9.3, madness is in their hearts when they live. You know, we, we don't do well. The Calvinists seem to have it right about the depravity of man. That does not excuse, it explains, it doesn't excuse, and God does not leave us without, without a rem remedy. We have a rem remedy for it in Christ and the law of God being applied. But that's a very good question. Is this the last question, I think, number five? So you touched on this earlier, that right. church authority or authority is ministerial and not magisterial. Yeah. But authorities like parents and husbands can make sinful, extra-biblical decisions that those under them have to submit to. Mm -hmm. So where, where is the line? You talk about the true nature of a parent or a husband's authority. If they're not commanding the child to do something that violates the law of God, I think the child's going to have to go along with it, like it or not. Uh, I don't think it's... Uh, but there comes a point in time when the child is wise enough. I mean, your, your, your task is, of course, to raise them up to be self-governing and for them to recognize right and wrong on their own, right? And recognize the left hand from the right hand, etc. And so to know right from wrong, good from evil. Uh, but it becomes dicier because you, 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 the child does not perceive the world the way that the parent perceives it. Sometimes the parent is right and the child perceives it wrong. Sometimes the parent is wrong and the child has the correct perception. Uh, and then my child might be as bright as a Samuel, right? And so you might want to listen to what he had to say. And so that, that becomes a much touchier one. That's why I think the, the, when the goal is to get the children to become self-governing Christians in their own right, uh, then that way we they have that ability to be trained to run their own households well. They learn all the errors that they see all the mistakes their parents make and try not to replicate them and reproduce what they saw was right with how their parents ruled. We must realize that we're setting the next generation in motion. We'll give it our best shot with our wisdom and then pray that we give them enough equipping that they can do better than we did. But uh, should a child suddenly say, he made me eat my potatoes that when they were cold, they were cold because I didn't want to eat them, and therefore I was abused. No, you know, the child is on, on, on the carpet for that. Uh, that's just a, just a fact of life. And, uh, and the very fact that you mentioned this brings to mind, of course, Hebrews 12. This is our fathers after the flesh corrected us or disciplined us as they seemed right to them, seemed fit to them. Um, but God always disciplines or chastises us uh, to our good. Every time when God does it, it's for our good. When our parents do it, sometimes it's too much too, or too little. They might let us do something and let it go, and, and that's not good because we say, I got away with something. And they might get away with something more or worse and not be reined in. Other times we might over-discipline uh, the child. And that's the point that Hebrews 12 us make, is that we don't guarantee that the child is getting perfect discipline. It's, it's kind of variable. It's some, it's, it's sometimes dad's uh, tired, and he might be too tired to discipline, or he might be so tired he gets angry dis over disciplines, right? Uh, human nature being what it is. So like Hebrews 12 acknowledges the fact that our whole human fathers chastise us, but not always perfectly, not according to uh, our best interests. And so that's a fact of life that we, we deal with, and we want to operate in terms of moving always closer and closer to the ideal. So if someone says, I think my dad was too harsh on me, I'm by, they might over actually compensate with their kids and go lenient, and that, those kids become much worse than that generation. So it's a very, very touchy thing because uh, we, we see there's a, ba a balance, a, a pendulum swinging between extremes, 
and somewhere the balance is in there, but only God seems to be able to hit that balance right on. We're imperfect, and we always, we always fail. But that's where God's grace comes in, and that's why forgiveness in the family is very important, and love in the family must be always be directed toward the raising of the children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Admonition includes some strong words and some strong actions on occasion, and nurturing is the part that we prefer to do, which is to, to nourish them and to raise them as Christians. But that's an interesting question. I think Hebrews 12 speaks exactly to that issue, indica indicates that it's simply a, a reality that we deal with. Uh, the realities that we deal with, laid out in Ecclesiastes 3, says, you know, this is the things that are, the sons of men are exercised in it, and it's very difficult. So it's part of being a, 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 a redeemed sinner. And the final question from yeah, Kyle. Two questions. two questions. Ask them one at a time. I won't remember the first one after you get through the second one. First question is, can you address Paul? Paul, Paul. the religious leader, murderer, part of the He becomes literally an apostle. Yeah. Can you address that in terms of the dynamic between somebody who is in grace, whatever you want to say, in the restoration for the religious leader? Right. And then you can that from the novel. Okay. So in uh, Saul of Tarsus, uh, he receives a new name for a very good reason because he's a different person at that point in time. Uh, the transformation that Christ worked in him from a murderer and a persecutor of the church to one of the foundation, foundational apostles and the, and the uh, foundation stones of the church is such a fundamental transformation that uh, what went before is meaningless. In fact, he even says, I count everything before is but done compared to the exceeding excellency of Christ. And so he said, I, was, I didn't deserve it. I'm the chief of sinners. And I think we have to take that literally. He was the chief of sinners. He's claiming he's worse than Hitler because he was raised as you know, the Hebrew of the Hebrews. The tribe of Benjamin knew the Torah and still he killed God's people and, and approved of Stevens and et cetera. So he considers himself a murderer who should not be, is not fit for an apostle. And the God said, that's exactly why I'm choosing you because you're my chosen vessel to take my message to the Gentiles. And so he wrote two thirds of the New Testament as a consequence. So you have to make a distinction in his lifetime as it moves from Saul into Paul that there's a transitional event. And so if he were to be a bad shepherd, that would be sanctioned, would have been after his conversion to Christ, at which point I call, but that he was called and put into the peculiar office of apostle. Uh, he was not an apostle prior to that. He was just someone, he was, he was the um, coat clerk for the killing of Stephen, right? hat check guy, I'll hold your cloak while you go throw stones and murder that man. Uh, but after that, he's a very, very different person and he's transformed. He's a new man. He put off the old man and put on the new. So we, we say there's a difference uh, when you have such a tr stupendous transformation in a person uh, that his clock starts at that point. Now, you might have temporal uh, um, things to pay for, for what happened before, but in terms of office under the Christian church, he was called out of that darkness into the light of God's church. And so at that point, the clock starts on him for a, a violation. Can you understand what I'm saying? So uh, there's a difference between Saul's culpability and Paul's culpability. There's a, the person has now been transformed. Scales came off of his eyes. He's uh, no longer kicking at the goads, and the Holy Spirit has now invaded him, transformed him. It's an intrusion of the power of the Holy Ghost into the man, and he's been reborn. And we have to take that rebirth very, very seriously, almost literally. It's the second birth. And now that he's reborn, he's under orders. And now he's culpable for those orders. And he counts everything before that as but dumb. For all that he, that he did as a Pharisee, he went through all the, the notions of, and he used the law unlawfully, as he knew. He says, the law is good if used lawfully, but it doesn't do anything for justification. So he transformed his whole outlook at that point in time that he was knocked off that horse on the way to Damascus, and God transformed him. He didn't eat for several days, and finally had the scales fall from his eyes after he was blinded. So I think it, you cannot equate the two as saying, well, he really should not have been made. God made him that. Well, God made him that after he transformed the man and took him out of the, Satan's kingdom and put him in God's kingdom. Whereas the people who are appointed in Ezekiel 34 are in God's kingdom, they're God's people, they are given this task of being a shepherd. They had the model of David in front of them, and they still hurt the flock. 
as far as Saul knew, he was protecting the flock from these wicked, corrupt Christians who were, who were heretics. Yeah? He said, I had a zeal, but not according to knowledge. Right? And according to what he says, such zeal persecuting the church. My zeal was perfect because I thought persecuting the church was the way to manifest it. But, it was not, but he was transformed. So I don't think you can take what happened in his pre-Christian life and then say, this, he, as a Christian minister, he should be pulled down because of what happened before he was converted. Yes, conversion, yeah, regeneration. So it's not right to extrapolate from that and somebody who's a great Christian leader or a pastor or a follower or something who is following, if he restores to the same level, he can cut Paul. No, Paul is not the archetype. There has to be clear, anyone falling on the ground. By the way, um, this arose out in several of the books because these um, tropes, as we call them, attempts to say, hey, this, um, this person was restored. David was restored after he did this, and Paul was restored, and Peter was restored after he did this. So what is, isn't restoration of the model? In fact, one of the, one of the books tries to emphasize this. But they say, you know, it's the funny thing is that um, Peter, when he was restored, after denying Christ three times, uh, it wasn't guilty of uh, accused of sexual abuse this is a woman and neither was Paul for that matter so uh, when it comes to clergymen that's a very very different story and David came closer to that uh, and of course it cost him his own son his young infant son perished as a consequence of his actions so the three things involved that he lost his son for there was the adultery there was the murder of Uriah, and most people missed the third one. He got Uriah drunk. So he, uh, <clears throat> he took away the one thing that separated Uriah from an animal, which was his rational thought, by putting the bottle to his mouth, which is condemned in Scripture. You should not to do it. So the prophets have specific uh, condemnations of doing that, and, and it's a culpable act. So he did that on top. So the three things that all got mixed up in what David did. So... Uh, the upshot is that these examples are always used to say, well, God, you know, these are God's men. But these people also paid, a, you know, David paid a huge price. He lost his son. You know, and there was no no repentance for that. God could have done. Why, between the two thinkers, God literally Yeah, let me, let me just talk about that word example. <clears throat> we do not get our doctrine from Old Te or New Testament examples. We get our doctrine, we, our marching orders, from the commands of Scripture from the moral imperatives of scripture where God says do this or do that or don't do this or don't do that. That's where we have moral clarity when a command is issued, you're on the, the hook for a command or an imperative. An example may be a good or a bad one or it might be a temporal, temporary one that has significance in a given period of time but not any other. So you can't take examples and say, well, polygamy, you know, a, whole, a whole bunch of good guys had, were polygamists so I'm gonna pick a few wives out from here, right? Because I, I got a, a biblical example for that. I have a biblical example for all sorts of things that the Bible actually says is not a good idea. Uh, not that. Sometimes they're, they're described as sins, and I think there's, there's uh, evidence against them. So we don't get our marching orders from examples. Uh, here's the case in point. There's a prediction in the scripture, 20, Matthew 24, 14, that the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, right? Uh, but we don't get our marching orders from that prediction. We get our marching orders from the command, go and make disciples of all nations, preaching the gospel, right? So the command of Matthew 28 is what you walk by, not the prediction in the four chapters earlier that the gospel would be preached in all the world, through all the land or whatever you might want to phrase it. Uh, my, my personal opinion is that that dealt with uh, the uh, land as it was back in the 70 AD. That was preached throughout the land then. But regardless of how you interpret that, the point is that our duty is determined by commands and not by predictions or examples. They can be examples of what to avoid, or they can be examples of what could be waiting for us if we transgress or bless, get blessed. But God's not on the, on the carpet to see all those examples play out in our lives. They, they don't have normative force, they don't have the moral force. Uh, except for Christ being the example. And even then, Christ, what did he say? I didn't, he didn't get married, so I'm going to follow Christ and not get married. 
I'm going to follow Christ and walk around barefoot. No, some likes it. So the point is, the, the PowerPoint example is limited in Scripture. It, does, it, it, it has to be constrained against the duties that are laid out in the commands. And if you have a conflict between the two, you go with the command. You do not go with an example or a prediction. You go with what's commanded. Right? Because uh, that's what we're on the, the hook for. And that's why I think it's dangerous for us to ignore the commands of Scripture and to set, a, set them at lot with saying, here's some examples. Well, maybe God has a prerogative that we don't have, right? And, uh, and maybe we're mishandling the example or we don't understand the purpose and God sometimes is glorified in man's sin. That doesn't mean that the sin is a good thing. It doesn't defend the sin. And people say, well, if it weren't for those Romans, you know, throwing them up on a cross, we wouldn't be saved. So it's an appropriate example of crucifixion is good for us. Good things can come from it. Well, God can transform a crucifixion into a good thing, but we can't. So it's not an example we can follow. Second question. What does the Bible say determine, where does the Bible, or what does the man determine, where does it say the origin of the definition of the victim, of the perk, of the first party, the elder, I say I'm being accused, but then I read that as my wife won't have to go to the store and get candy. That's awesome. Yeah. So However, the, what happens when you get into more, more real things where it's like who determines if they're being abused? Especially if you have conflict like you know, like, oh well I can see this clearly and it's not abuse, but he or she says this. Mm -hmm. All right. And we're aware of uh, some folks um, who are attempting to expand the scope of abuse to things that look ter terribly benign from anyone, any normal aspect, and those are all now being elevated to horrible abuses. Uh, to have an abuse, you have to have an abuser and an abused person and the action by which the abuse is perpetrated, which could be multiple actions at multiple levels, physical, psychological, emotional. So it is a nexus of three complicated things. And such a thing as a concept is very, very difficult to reduce to words. Like I said, you can see, that's why the imagery in scripture is used that I was quoting from Ezekiel 34 about dirty water and, and, and stepping all over the stuff and pushing with the shoulder, which is mentioned a little bit earlier in the passage. Um, you, you, you shove them with the shoulder aside and they get, uh, which means it was just bullying, right? The scripture doesn't use the word bullying, but bullying is imaged in this passage. So that's why we have the benefit of these pictures to indicate when it's occurring and when it's a false use of authority. And by the way, the point of the shepherd, again, is to shield, protect, and things. So if the opposite is happening, if harm is being done, uh, and we're using the instruments of a foolish shepherd, now we're on, again, in the air realm of abuse, where we're literally hurting somebody. Um, and one of the f key factors then is the depersonalization involved, the uh, dehumanizing effect, the demoralizing effect, <coughs> all these things, and I'm not, not, and I'm not even getting into physical abuse, where uh, you know now someone is being uh, beaten or hurt, and then has to cover it up, or else they're in trouble like, even more, right? So th there's a range of things that constitute abuse, and I think, it, it, and what happens is that you trivialize the serious abuse if you start to add in like he didn't let me buy, buy, buy that hat this week, made me wait till the next week to buy the hat. If that starts to become an, uh, a case of spousal abuse, then no one's gonna pay very much attention. We're gonna be crying wolf, right? So, uh, it's, and most people will say, you know, there's a give and take in, say, a marriage. There's gonna be even a give and take between pastor and flock. Um, where they say, you know, within a given range, we have some um, room to maneuver. <coughs> The range of socially validated and acceptable behavior in a situation can not, is not necessarily narrow, where it says, if you move one inch closer, it's abuse. And if you move one, and if I move one inch closer, I'm abusing you, right? That, that's not necessarily the case. So it's not, it, it's, the upshot is that it is a general concept and that we should probably reserve the term for things where actual harm is being done, whether it's physical or emotional harm. If so, and then if there's a question, then perhaps then the experts can come in and say, let's take a look, is this abuse or not? 
and uh, they're going to have to struggle with uh, the question of definition no less than anyone else. No two people are going to have the exact same definition of abuse because you're going to see a spectrum and some people say this is actionable but that's not. Someone else might say no it should move, the line should be over here that's still pretty I think that's pretty bad and someone else you know might say well I think you can a woman can tolerate so many physical beatings and you say wow are you serious you, 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 is, that, is that your position well you know that's what the cane is for and, and all sorts of horrible things are come out of your mouth and you say you're saying this in the name of scripture uh, so we have to then draw the line in terms of, in actual fact, the victim. Because it's the victim's situation that needs the deliverance, right? She's the one calling out for the deliverance. So if it's a legitimate claim, then the deliverance should happen. And she's not going to call out for deliverance if she wasn't going to get the hat. Now she might say, I'm going to divorce my husband for the hat, over the hat. But that simply means that she's in sin at that point. But when the church has to move into play and to say we want to deal with this situation, they're going to deal with a serious situation. You know, uh, so they're not going to exaggerate or minimize. They want to get it exactly the way it is so that justice arises. But yes, we, we struggle for a definition because of the complexity. You have the abuser, the abused, and the action that is the abuse between the parties in question. And then you have the circle of social uh, context in which additional harm can be uh, thrown on the abused person. Because now, like I said, someone says, the original abuse hurt me, but then the church destroyed me. And so we, then we have it. How do you count that into the mix? That's abuse too. It's abuse by collusion and silence and the uh, tactics that we described in the second lecture. And they're just as abusive, if not more so, than the original abuse. That's what triggered the suicide that I mentioned. That's what uh, creates most of the tr post-traumatic stress disorder that people, that vi victims come from, uh, arise from. Not from the original abuse, but from the church's bad handling of it. Which is the purpose of, the, of this conference is to wake us up to say the church needs to start handling it right, prioritizing this, doing the study, getting this oriented as a kingdom prerogative, which is the reason that I'm here. Well, I think that's the last of the questions. <laughs>